Now today, again, we have someone different. I suppose everyone's different, but remember that this is a, a summer school on human ethology. And so in human, you think ethology, what do you expect? Um, you know, the sort of thing that, that Professor Grammer was talking about yesterday, behaviour, observational method, fixed action patterns, um, differentiating in the innate behaviours from learnt behaviour, these sorts of things. That's true, but ethology is much broader than that. Ethology is the biology of behaviour. It, it, it's a broad, it encompasses broad biological methods for understanding behaviour. And don't forget behaviour is not only differences between individuals, how men and women behave or how two different men or two different women are different in, in their personality. It's also differences between groups. And because it's biological, ethology does everything from learning to genetics. And this morning we do some genetics. All right. Now we have with us today Professor Vince Sarich. And I'm a little shocked because I just asked Vince uh, quickly, just remind me, what's, what's, your, what's your most important contribution? Tell me what you did so I can, you know, quick, so I can look knowledgeable in front of the students. And he said, well, uh, uh, 1967, um, with colleague Alan Wilson, 1967, Sarich and Wilson were the first to argue, hey, We've got a now, with genetics, a different way of, ju of, of judging how old humans are. You know, when humans first appeared, or, or when humans and chimpanzees split. This is the key point. We, we knew that, that the great apes were the closest. The question is when. Now, the previous methods were, you'd look at skulls, you'd look at, at skulls and bones, and you'd look at the strata in which they were found, and, you'd, you, and then you'd use carbon dating, and so on and so forth. Not, not bad, interesting methods. The, the, the methods that um, Vince Sarich helped develop were revolutionary different. He said, well, what, we know that mutations occur, or we think they occur at certain rates, so if we look at genetic differences and add up the, the number of mutants that are different, perhaps we can get some sort of, a, of, of assessment. And his first estimate was five million years. And I think it was not popular, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> That's People one way of putting this, it. This five million years between chimps and humans, you've got, this is ridiculous. But now I read every day in the newspaper some new application of this method to splitting of Different, um, different species and, and, and different ageing. The five million figure, five million years, is holding up not bad. Vince Sarich is Professor Emeritus at Berkeley, University of Berkeley in Northern California, and he's here today to, to apply this, these genetic methods and others to talking about, to conceptualising group differences. I'll let you take it from there. Thanks, Frank. Dobro jutro. Let me, let me just mention as an aside about me. More volume. More volume. Am I on? Yes? You must be closer. I'll have to make love to the microphone. Okay. Uh, just as a mention, my first language was Croatian, Hrvatski. And so I understand a fair amount of Russian but I would not presume to insult you by trying to use any of it. Because number one, Croatian and Russian are not all that close. And number two, it's been 60 years since I really did any serious talking in Croatian, okay? Now, as Frank said, my original contribution to science was my doctoral dissertation effort uh, collaborating with Alan Wilson, uh, trying to work out the relationships among uh, higher primates and trying to figure out when in fact our lineage diverged from lineages leading to other primates and as he said the date we got then has held up very well over time. Now as a part of today's lecture I will be dealing with a time at the other end of the human scale 
In other words, the first work was about dating when humans last shared a common ancestor with African apes. Part of today's effort will have to do with when did humans last share relationships with one another at the populational level. In other words, how old are human populational or racial lineages? That'll be at least one part, although not the major part, of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to start with just showing my little abstract. Um, and as I said, if we start with three individuals, let's say one of you, somebody down in Nairobi, and a chimpanzee, and we're now able to line up the DNAs and count differences precisely. Between you or the Kenyan and a chimpanzee, there might be one difference at about every 70 or 80 bases along the DNA sequence. If you line up the DNA of you and the Kenyan, there might be one difference in about 1,000 bases. However, if you line up the difference in yourselves between the, gene, the DNA you got from your mother and the DNA you got your, from your father, the amount of difference will be very nearly as much as the difference between you and a person in another population. So at first, the overall differences are very small in quantitative terms. And they are remarkably small when you talk about relationships within our species. In other words, by, at the DNA level, we're not all that different from chimpanzees and gorillas. But further on, we're hardly at all noticeably different, in a sense, from ourselves at the gene level. And this has tempted people, and they've not been able to resist the temptation, to take the object lesson that these differences, because they are quantitatively small, are therefore qualitatively unimportant. The genetic variation in our species is more or less irrelevant, and for all practical purposes, we're pretty much the same. And it'll be my message here that neither one of those is true. We are not pretty much the same either at the individual level or the group level when it comes to considering the range of variation that's present in our species. And a good part of a discussion of this sort has been tied up with the notion of race. And I laid out some questions about race, which I'll try to deal with uh, briefly or such depending. First, race is a salient feature of the everyday world. This is true uh, in fact or in law. In my own country, racial identification has become, or has been for a long time and continues to be, an important identifier, unfortunately, of people and also a determiner of what you may get or what you may not get. So, Race, as I say, is still a very salient feature of the everyday world, and we want to know what about it. Um, races, human races, are very strongly marked morphologically. I'd say more strongly marked, marked morphologically than in any other species. And the only comparable uh, species is dogs, but of course we've been helping them along. We could make people a lot more different than they are from one another using methods of that sort. Fortunately, we haven't done so. Human races are young. Uh, this goes back now to the dating business. With most racial variation as we see it today, no older than maybe about 20, 25, 30,000 years. Now let's hold that topic now in place. Now, this business of human genetic differentiation, 
has uh, attracted everyone's attention in recent years, especially with the Human Genome Project. And it even made the year 2000 State of the Union uh, message, that is from our American President to the American Congress. And he said, I just want to say one more thing about this. And I want every one of you to think about this the next time you get mad at one of your colleagues on the other side of the aisle. This fall at the White House, Hillary had one of her Millennium Dinners, and we had this very distinguished scientist there who was an expert in this work in the human genome. And he said that we are all, regardless of race, genetically 99.9% .9 the same. And that's true, remarkably enough. Uh, one difference in a thousand. Now, you may find that uncomfortable when you look around here, but it is worth remembering. We can laugh about this, but you think about it. Modern science has confirmed what ancient faiths have always taught. The most important fact of life is our common humanity. Therefore, we should do more than just tolerate our diversity. We should honor it and celebrate it. However, in what I'm going to say, I want you to keep one more thing in mind. All right? The genetic differences are very small. It's very easy for, to go from that to saying they're irrelevant, unimportant, uh, you can ignore them as far as everyday life is concerned. Now, there is another species which I've already mentioned, dogs. And I think that whenever you start thinking, well, inter-individual or inter-group differences in people are irrelevant because they're so small genetically, Think about dogs, because at this point, we are not able genetically, using DNA methods, to distinguish wolves from dogs, never mind breeds of dogs from one another. So as I wrote up once, whenever you're feeling that way, you think, and I don't know the Russian words for the breeds, okay, and I didn't think to look them up. Dog, wolf, dachshund, Great Dane, Chihuahua, St. Bernard, Bulldog, Collie, Dog, Wolf, Afghan, Pekingese, and so forth and so on. In other words, what you have there is a situation where no one doubts that the breed differences in morphology, size, morphology, and behavior are genetically based. That's the only way we've been able to select and produce the different breeds from one another because, in fact, the differences are genetically based. But the differences are so small between the breeds and even between wolves and dogs that we, in fact, are not able to measure any. Nonetheless, we have these very large, much larger than anything we see in our own species, very large, morphological and behavioral differences. So I just keep dogs in mind, okay, when you think about the meaning of people differences. Now, there is, I don't know what the situation is in this country, maybe some of you can inform me or us in discussion later on, but race is a very touchy subject in my own country and a surely touchy subject throughout Europe. Now, my own definition is that races are populations or groups of populations within a species that are separated geographically from other such populations or groups of populations and distinguishable from them on the basis of heritable features. And races exist to the extent that we can look at individuals, and let's use looking here broadly, that includes looking at the genetic level at DNA and so forth, okay? To the extent that we can look at individuals and place them into their area of recent ancestry. All right. Now, races aren't species. <laughs> 
Therefore, they are not discrete. That is, cleanly separated from one another. Races merge into one another. They're supposed to. So as I said, yes, races do blend into one another. They're supposed to. If they didn't, they'd be species. Now we, now, but people seem to have a lot of trouble with the notion of having non-discrete categories. But as I point out here, the fact is, if we insisted on categories being non-discrete, and this point was brought up yesterday as well, if we insisted on categories being, uh, uh, sorry, insisted on categories being discrete, then many fields of investigation would grind to a very rapid halt. For example, languages. Languages are not discrete from one another. At contact areas, they blend into one another. But that fact doesn't prevent people from recognizing the fact that there are such things as languages. Or to take a political uh, uh, category, class. Now, classes are certainly less discrete than races are. Nonetheless, many people, many sociologists who would be dead without the notion of class, deny the notion of race. So that's another matter. Races do not have to be discrete. They shouldn't be discrete. And the fact is categories do not need to be discrete to be useful categories. Now, let's get starting toward the genetic end of this. One, perhaps the most famous, most influential quote in this realm was, given by Richard, was written by Richard Lewontin in 1974 in his book, The Genetic Basis of Evolutionary Change. And he said, it is clear that our perception of relatively large differences between human races and subgroups as compared to the variation within these groups is indeed a biased perception and that based on randomly chosen genetic differences, human races and populations are remarkably similar to one another, with the largest part by far of human variation being accounted for by the differences between individuals. And the numbers he gave were about 85-15 that is, of the genetic variation data which were available at that time, something in the order of 10 to 15 percent of the variation was inter, or between populations, and about 85 percent to 90 percent was within populations. So the largest amount of the variation was, in fact, within populations. And he goes on to say the object message, the object lesson here, is that human racial classification is of no social value and is positively destructive of social and human relations. Since such racial classification is now known to be of virtually no genetic or taxonomic significance either, no justification can be offered for its continuance. So there's both the message, the data and the analysis, which were correct, are, remain correct, that 10 to 15 percent is, in fact, what it looks like, even almost 30 years later. And then, but the second part is the part that I'm going to be questioning here. All right. Now, as Frank said, as I mentioned, my early work, my first scientific work, was in the realm of timing the origin of our lineage, not of Homo sapiens but of hominids, okay, Australopithecines, Homo erectus, and so forth. Here, we're, I'm interested in timing the event which led to the origin of our species and of populational diversification within the species. And that has been a major topic of controversy for, well, it, of particular controversy for about the last 20 or 25 years. And in fact, the answer that I had, and indeed the answer I had when I wrote the abstract, 
is not the answer I have now. Because in the last few months, DNA data have been published which have convinced me that the way I was looking at this matter was wrong. Just wrong, okay? And a little bit further along, I say to myself, Vince, you were really dumb. Okay. As we say, hindsight is wonderful, okay? But I look at the situation now and I say, how could I have been so wrong for so many years? And what we have is two lines of DNA evidence. One line from the Y chromosome, one line from mitochondrial DNA. In both cases, the inheritance is clonal. In other words, for the Y chromosome, which is present obviously only in males, the father passes on his Y chromosome to his son, the son to the son, and so forth and so on. So you can trace a Y chromosome lineage directly to its origin. It doesn't get confused with any other pieces of DNA. By the same token, the mitochondrial DNA, which is a loop of DNA of about 16,000 base pairs present in the mitochondria. It's passed on, in this case, it's present, of course, in both males and females, but it's passed on only from mother to daughter. So that one then has a lineage, a mitochondrial lineage, which can be traced all the way back to its origin in the same way that the Y chromosome lineage can be traced back to its origin. And this this evidence, okay, these data from the Y chromosome and from the mitochondria came to a head, as far as I'm concerned, in November and December of last year. Just a few months ago. Because a group at Stanford University, which is about 50 miles south of where I am headquartered at Berkeley, published a Y chromosome tree for all human beings. Okay. And then a group in Germany published a mitochondrial tree for all humans. And as I'll show you here, those two trees are basically congruent. They give you exactly the same message. So here is the one that was published first in November. So what one notes then, okay, we start here. That's where all human y, y chromosomes that exist today come back to a common ancestral Y chromosome. Oh, okay. And what you see here is certain different lineages. And the point here is that, well, let me just make, ah, this is the, what? Okay. What we then have is these, these numbers mark specific mutations. And the thing about the Y chromosome is that the mutations tend to be independent of one another. I mean, there is so much DNA present, the rate of change is so uh, low that it's very unlikely that the same mutation will occur more than once in any reasonably sized tree. So these differences then occur only once, and therefore the tree, in comparison to others, is pretty much unequivocal. This is the way it is, and there really isn't any doubt about it. Okay? There aren't any statistical tests necessary. And what we have here is two lineages, one marked by this mutation, another one marked by, these th uh, by this mutation here. And these two groups, lab labeled one 
and two are entirely African. These individuals here are all today African individuals. When we get to group three, okay, we have Africans, but also other human populations. And the same then is true for the rest of the tree. Uh, there's no lines here because they were in yellow and the zip copy machine did not copy the yellow. Okay, but imagine there are lines from every number here to every number down here, just as for the rest of the tree. So this was the Y chromosome tree, and the basic message is that the origin of our species is African, and there was an exit out of Africa at some later time marked by this mutation here. So everybody, all non-Africans, and a number of Africans share this mutation. And what we can then ask is a little bit later, okay, this is what the tree looks like. It's an out of Africa situation. How long ago was that mutation? Because this then, this mutation basically dates when the ancestral human population came out of Africa. Okay, and I'll show you the numbers on how to calculate that in a few minutes. So this is the Y chromosome tree. If we then go on, to the modicum. Okay, so it's technically a real tour de force. And what comes out of this is, okay, the oldest lineages are African. Everybody down here is African. We follow this lineage then to here, which is the common ancestral point of some Africans and everybody else. All right. We basically run out of Africans here. All of the rest of these people are non-Africans. Chukchi, Australian, Pima Indian, Italian, Papua New Guinea, and so forth. So we have basically the same tree. If you remember the, the Y chromosome tree, we had two only African lineages, and then the rest of the tree. And you have basically the same situation here. Again, in just a minute, we'll calculate what kind of times are involved in when was this? When was the out of Africa event? But as I say, these data, the Y chromosome data and the mitochondrial data have convinced me, I've been very stubborn about this, have convinced me that it is out of Africa that in fact, all living humans derive from a single ancestral population that came out of presumably Northeast Africa some numbers of tens of thousands of years ago. And more important, and as important, of course there were people around the rest of that world at that time. As far as we can tell, none of their genes survive none of their genes have descendants in living populations. And as people kept saying at the meetings I was at this spring, no old lineages. We've looked at 12,000 Asians and there are no old lineages. And I want to point out here, to give credit where credit is due, that Alan Wilson recognized the potential of this approach back around 1978. And a graduate student of mine did the first major effort in this realm, Becky Kahn, get, publishing her dissertation in 1982. And this is Becky's tree which was done on much more primitive technology and looking at a, only about 10% of the mitochondrial genome as compared to the 100% look that Svante Pabo and his group had last year. But in any case, this tree, if we look here, the Africans are the black dots here. So what we have is an African lineage and then everybody else. So we had an out of Africa uh, message. We've had one, I've had one, 
for more than 20 years now. The problem was, for me and for many other people, twofold. The first problem was that the date that was given was awfully old. In other words, this date was calculated at somewhere around 100 to 150,000 years, and we couldn't see anything in the fossil archaeological record to justify that kind of date. The other part of it is that there was, because there is a tremendous amount of repeated mutation in mitochondrial systems, there was much, there was a substantial amount of uncertainty about the shape of this tree, about whether, for example, there really was an African base group. But the fact is now that what Becky Kahn said in 1982 is in fact borne out by the latest data, which <coughs> are unequivocal. Okay? It is an out of Africa situation. Now we date it and we say whoops. let's just take this as an example uh, these showed an out of Africa event with on the average about 14 changes from the mitochondrial DNA ancestral to all Africans to the mitochondrial DNAs of non-Africans today. And we had the human chimpanzee figure of 5 million years and at the DNA level humans and chimpanzees differ by 17 percent. So one can very rapidly work that calculation out. Uh, and that turns out a date of about 52,000 years. And by the same token, in the earlier uh, the Y chromosome data, they came out with a date of 44,000 years. So now, on the basis, I like to wander around. So now on the basis, okay, of very solid DNA data, which as far as I can tell, are not really questionable. It says that somewhere around 50,000 years, maybe a bit less ago, we had a population come out of Africa which was presumably advantaged in some way, genetically. This population, because of this genetic advantage, was able to take over the rest of the world, expanding, all right. And they did so without mixing with the other populations that were around at the time. This is a very difficult scenario to swallow, frankly. Because we then come to the point of what was this genetically based advantage and why was there no admixture? And that's something we might think about. Okay. Now this is one message, okay, this is the time message. I will ask for a few questions if any, if there are any at this point before I go on to functional matters. Yes? Well, the last point is what I am most interested in. And since I'm not as familiar as I should be with methodology and technology, that the out of Africa group never mixed with the other hominid groups. Okay, well this, as far as these, the, as far as the mitochondrial data and the Y chromosome data, okay, there isn't any judgment call there, okay? Basically it's saying when we draw the trees, we don't have a long lineage, okay, that connects up with some non-African. But, but I'm linking that statement with your first statement, which is we cannot distinguish wolves. I remember your dog. Yes. Wolves, dogs, howies, same. That's thing. right. We cannot distinguish. But we can distinguish the human beings using the same technology. Okay. And you can tell me for a fact that no Neanderthal genes have. Yes, flatly. There are no Neanderthal genes in modern human populations because they're, 
because the genes in modern human population are too young. This is exactly the argument that Alan Wilson and I made 35 years ago about a fossil. Okay? There was this fossil called Ramapithecus, which was 14 million years old, okay? and we said this can't be a human ancestor, not because of what it looks like, okay? but just because it's too old. The Neanderthals can't be human ancestors because their DNAs are too old. See, there are, old, there are old Neanderthal lineages, but there aren't any Neanderthals. We have records uh, We have morphologically modern looking people in well, Kafsa are the best data in Israel that are about 100,000 years old and that are modern looking, okay? It's just that the modern human morphology must have evolved more than once, okay? And although I'm not gonna have time to go into this at any length, we, I can show that there's a great deal of convergent evolution in human morphology so that we have a group of people on the Moriori, uh, on the Chatham Islands, east of New Zealand, called the Moriori. Okay. We know how long they had been there. Not, it's not just a few hundred years. Nonetheless, when you compare their, the metrics, the skull measurements and so forth, what you find is that they look like American Indians more than they look like Maoris. So in a few hundred years, one can get so nobody presumes that the American Indians sailed from South America and populated the Chathams, all right? But we can get convergence on particular human morphologies, apparently in a very short period of time, under the effects of selection. So the fact that you have something that looks modern human and metrically is modern human doesn't have to be ancestral, doesn't have to, in fact, have modern human descendants anywhere. And I, that's what I think the situation is, because in, in the Near East, where, you know, where Kafsa is, you have these modern-looking humans before you have Neanderthals. So you have the modern-looking humans, then a little later on you have Neanderthals, and then, then you're back to having modern-looking humans. And those modern-looking human, modern humans, te their technology was ne Neanderthal technology. Okay. You can't tell them apart culturally. Question. Just a point. Um, Neanderthals are not our ancestors, but we would have shared most of our genes with Neanderthals. Uh, we do. See, so what you mean was the distinctively Neanderthal genes we don't have, but all the rest we have, like with chimps. Well, like with chimps, we share. We share ninety. Exactly, we share ninety-eight point seven percent of individual base pairs with chimpanzees. With Neanderthals, we presumably share 99 point whatever, but it's those distinctive lineages, okay, that make that, when we look at the mitochondrial DNA or the Y chromosome stuff, when, when we follow those lineages, which evolve much more rapidly, okay, and, and demarcate individuals and populations, then we see no connection. Linda. the way I thought for a long time. I, mean, I didn't like this scenario. I mean, this is the one I started with as a graduate student. This was a standard story in the 50s and the 60s. I didn't like it because it implied that these other people who were around at the time, okay, were too dumb to cotton on to what these new people were doing and copy them. Okay, I, that was very hard because as far as we could tell from in the archaeological record all the way back, people were sharing information. And all of a sudden, we're saying, well, they weren't sharing information. So I, and, and this is the problem, okay, that if it were just cultural, 
it, that if it were not genetically based, then in fact you'd have um, uh, people sharing information, borrowing and so forth and so on, and mixing. But we don't see the mixing and that almost forces you to say it was something genetic which couldn't be shared. Okay. Should I, oh, you want to, Frank? As my partner and I were kidding around on this uh, <laughs> not long ago, and when you sit down and you look at this scenario that's being proposed, you're really asking for two miracles. And I'm really bothered by it because you're asking for some fairly complex genetic adaptation which allowed these people to do something that the other people couldn't do. And at the same time, you're asking to evolve reproductive isolation. Now, reproductive isolation, I mean, as all of you know, is, a, the, is the normal event after species separate from one another, they ultimately develop reproductive isolation. Uh, but generally, we're talking about a fairly long period of time. Here, we're talking about reproductive isolation going along with this other. So it's, it's, you're asking for, you know, I'm, for two miracles, but I can't read the molecular data any other way. I mean, I'm kind of obsessed about this stuff. And then I saw, a, I heard a talk given by Peter Underhill, who was one of the Y chromosome people at Stanford in, in January. And as, as I was quoted saying, I had an epiphany. I said, okay, this is it. I, they can't do any better than this, okay. So let me go on for a few more minutes and then we'll have our break and then I'll continue with the other half of the presentation.